So I'm going to talk to you not so much about the future of work, but the present state of work, which I can summarize in two sentences. The workplace is killing people, which is a bad idea, and no one cares, which I believe is a, work, a worse idea. And as we are you know, affecting in a profound and negative way uh, the health of workers throughout the world, actually, uh, one of the interesting questions is, is how long will this go on? We are on a truly unsustainable path, which is one of the things I want to convince you of. And by the way, it is completely fixable. It is possible to increase company profits. It is possible to increase company engagement. It is possible to increase worker well-being, both physically and mentally. Um, it is possible to cut your health care costs. But it is in order to do any of that, you are actually going to have to do something. <laughs> What is the definition of insanity, I guess, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, which is oftentimes what you see. Um, and the first point I would like to make is that every organization in this room is in the healthcare business. Some of you are in the healthcare business because you're large employers and you are providing healthcare to your employees through um, uh, self-insurance. Everybody in this room is in the healthcare business because if you have created a workplace, you are profoundly through that workplace affecting people's physical and mental health. Every day human beings come to work, what you do to them and for them um, affects their outcomes at the end of the day, whether they will leave at the end of the day in better shape or worse shape. And there's a ton of data on that, some of which we're going to go through. So number one, every organization is in the healthcare business. And the first message I would give to you is you ought to understand that and respect that and understand that that is a responsibility. You are in the healthcare business. Secondly, the workplace is a place where most countries have fixed the relatively straightforward things to fix with respect to health and safety. We've cleaned up chemical spills for the most part. We've cleaned up accidents for the most part. We've cleaned up you know, machines that cut people's arms and legs off. So we have cleaned up the things that OSHA has focused on, both here and around the world. Meanwhile, we have done almost nothing for the psychosocial risks, which are getting worse as we go on. I don't know if you know this. I'm trying to get somebody in the US to do this. Nobody will. In, you, in, in, um, in France, one of the large French telecom companies said, we're going to do a restructuring. And we are going to do the restructuring in a typical way, which is very stressful for the workers. A number of workers committed suicide, and much to everybody's surprise, particularly the French executives who were running the French telecom companies, uh, they were arrested. And by the way, convicted. So there is an interesting story. So while we are fixing, have fixed, uh, basically health and safety things, the psychosocial risk of work um, have expanded dramatically. And there's some data on that that I'll share with you in a minute. We have known for probably 40 years what are the management practices that make people sick. And um, we'll go through some of them. And some things that you could clean up relatively quickly and make your organization much more effective in a variety of different ways. And finally, it is completely feasible to reduce the human toll and, by the way, the economic toll of unhealthy work practices um, and, in the process, reduce costs of absenteeism, turnover, and presenteeism. The general finding in the literature is that if you spend a dollar on making somebody better because the, uh, on their health care costs, you're probably spending somewhere between two to five dollars on the indirect costs of their illness. Presenteeism, absenteeism, turnover, product, uh, productivity loss. So as I tell my friends at Stanford, we spend $200 million a year at Stanford on health care costs. It is probably costing us a billion dollars a year in presenteeism, absenteeism, turnover, and the other indirect costs of what it means to have ill employees in the workforce. So we're going to go through all of this relatively quickly and give you a ton of data. There is more data that I could give you. That's all in Dying for a Paycheck and in the blogs I write uh, for Cornerstone On Demand and on LinkedIn and a bunch of other places. The toll is enormous. 
According to the Centers for Disease Control, not me, not some goofy Stanford professor, the Centers for Disease Control will tell you, and this is a quote from them, the workplace stress is the leading workplace health problem. It ranks above physical inact inactivity and obesity. Many of you, I'm sure, have, as we have, uh, programs to get people to move, get people to eat better, get people to you know, do all the kinds of things that we're supposed to do, stop drinking, stop smoking, stop taking drugs, or maybe start taking drugs, whatever. Um, the number one workplace problem, according to the Centers for Disease Control, is workplace stress. Workplace stress creates, and through the behaviors it induces, chronic disease. Everybody understands intuitively that there is a chronic disease problem, by the way, not just in the United States, but around the world. Here's an interesting statistic for you. Less than one quarter of all US workers, not all US people, but workers as people in the labor force, have no chronic disease. Close to 40% have three or more. For those of people in the room who are worried about workplace costs, health costs, there you go. The, number, the greater the number of chronic diseases, the higher the cost, that's not big, that's not big news. But that's, that is an amazing statistic to think that only one quarter of the US workforce has no chronic disease. And many of them have three or more. Next, 90% of the United States healthcare spend is spent on chronic disease. That again comes from the Center for Disease Control. So people say we're spending too much on healthcare. If you're spending too much on healthcare, which we certainly are, the road to fix healthcare spend in your company or in society is through the workplace. A Stanford study done by me and some colleagues published in a journal called Management Science did some fancy analytics, which passed peer review, and estimates that the workplace is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States, greater than Alzheimer's, greater than kidney disease, about 120,000 people a year. It's 40 World Trade Centers a year. Excess deaths annually. And if you want, later on, you can ask me questions of how we did this. But it's quite, quite, quite straightforward. I, uh, by the way, when I talk to my friends in HR and in HR consulting about this, and I showed them the method, and I gave them the number, I said, what do you think about this? And they said, this number is way off. It's much too low, which, by the way, I believe. So again, the workplace is exacting an enormous toll on people. The American Institute of Stress says that job stress carries a price tag for US industry of $300 billion. For those of you who are interested in things outside the US, Vitality UK, which runs Britain's healthiest workplace survey, is some interesting data. Not so much the data, but the trend in the data. They find that moderate to severe depression has doubled in five years. And days of productivity lost per employee per year from absenteeism and presenteeism has increased 65% in five years. Now, if you believe that this is just because of vitality and it's just in the UK, you're kidding yourself. These numbers, I'm 100% sure, are, are typical for what you would see in virtually any country and certainly in the United States, where workplace depression is a big problem, workplace stress is a, is a huge problem, and the cost to that in terms of uh, lost time and lost productivity is enormous. So the good news for you is that there's lots of opportunity for improvement. And the even better news for you is that the improvement is relatively straightforward if you are willing to do what you ought to do. Meta-analyses show that many workplace conditions, which I'm about to talk about, are as harmful to health as secondhand smoke, a known and regulated carcinogen. Mental Health America says more than seven of 10 employees admitted bad, that they badmouthed their employer, and three quarters of them said they were either actively seeking a new job or thinking about doing so. Turnover, absenteeism, presenteeism, workplace health issues, they all come from the same source, which is a set of workplace practices which are harmful to human beings, and that's what we're gonna talk about in a little minute. But first, to get you a sense of the worldwide scope of this, the World Health Organization reports 850,000 deaths worldwide and 24 million 
um, years of life lost in China. They claim alone a million deaths a year from overwork. The World Economic Forum has some interesting report that just came out that says the lack of wellness in the labor force costs the global economy somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of GDP, which in the U.S. translates to $2.2 trillion a year. So the numbers are big. The toll is enormous. Um, the, the question is, what are we going to do about it? OSHA estimates 2 million people a year are victims of workplace violence. So for those of you who have health and wellness programs and try to get people to eat better, sleep better, stop drinking, stop smoking, stop taking drugs, you need to understand that the, the data is absolutely clear that stress is a source of most, most of these in, uh, unhealthy individual behaviors. Uh, this is psychiatrist Richard Friedman, who writes all the time for the New York Times. No one will be surprised to learn that stress makes people more likely to search for solace in drugs or food. After all, we call it comfort food for a reason, if you think about it. Now we have a body of research that makes the connection between stress and addiction definitive. So when you take people into the workplace and do things which we're about to talk about that stress them, you are going to produce reasonably reliably unhealthy behaviors. Over, so they will smoke more, they will drink more, they will eat more, they will exercise less, they will do all kinds of things. So if you want to have effective health and vitality programs, the first thing you need to do is you need to change the workplace because otherwise the evidence is quite clear the wellness programs aren't going to work because the wellness programs are focused on remediation and we know that prevention is way more effective than remediation. The source of most stress is the workplace. We know that. There's a bunch of data that demonstrates that. Organiza organizational decisions and practices that affect human health. Here are the things you need to clean up. Number one, you need to provide people health insurance. You say, I'm offering health insurance. We'll come back to that in a minute. Many people who think they're offering health insurance aren't. Um, the Kaiser Family Foundation shows that basically of the people Companies that are offering their employees health insurance, on average, only 61% of the people are enrolled in health insurance because of eligibility requirements, because of economic requirements. We'll get to that in a second. Health insurance is good. Without health care, you don't have much health. Job design is very important. It's the number one thing I think people can do to fix the workplace, fix problems of engagement, fix problems of stress, fix problems of, um, dis of, um, of, of all these things, of presenteeism. We're going to end with the uh, emphasis on job design. You need to, the only way you're going to fix uh, workplace health, and for that matter, workplace engagement and well-being, is to, is to do something that I've found in some recent research employers are extremely reluctant to do, which is look at the, which is, do, which is redesign their jobs. We have redesigned our products, by the way. Every company in this room has redesigned products and services. You've hired IDEO or Frog Design or done design thinking or something, and you've said, oh, we're going to redesign our, our products so that people will be able to use them. We're going to redesign our customer experience so that customers will love it. Redesign your jobs. You need to have user-centered job design, just as you've had customer-centered product design. Next, work hours and shift work. Providing social support, which is a great way to buffer and reduce stress. Practices and policies that affect work-family conflict. Perceived fairness and injustice. It turns out that when you um, abuse people, bully people, sexually harass people, treat them in an unfair fashion, most people will experience that as stress. <laughs> and layoffs and economic insecurity, which is probably the number one one of the biggest sources of stress in the workplace today. The fact that no one knows whether they're going to have a job or how long they're going to have a job or what their schedules are going to be uh, from one week to the next, particularly in these retail uh, or banks establishments that use all these fancy scheduling software. All right, let's go through this one at a time. 
literally hundreds of studies have documented the fact that the uninsured have worse health outcomes than the insured. This is why when our politician friends talk about health insurance as some abstract thing, they're actually talking about killing people. Um, so I actually tell political friends of mine or former friends of mine uh, that when you take away people's health insurance, you're actually killing them. And you cannot possibly be pro-life and anti-health care at the same time. Uninsured adults are less likely to use preventive screenings. And by the way, that absence of use of preventive screenings lasts even if they, after they reacquire health insurance. Uh, a 2009 study estimated 45,000 excess deaths per year in the United States just from an absence of health insurance. So that's about half of the 120,000 excess deaths we've estimated. Here's an interesting question. Do you offer health insurance? That's interesting. Gallup asks a very interesting question. Have you, within the past 12 months, foregone filling a prescription or getting health care? Because for you or a member of your family, because of cost. And the number there is staggeringly high. One third of the US population answers that question, yes. I have foregone health care. I have foregone filling a prescription because of cost. This goes to the Kaiser Family Foundation data, which I've already alluded to. Even for employers offering health insurance, only about 61% of the people are covered. And in case you didn't know, because, you, because Elizabeth Warren has started talking about everything else besides this, which is the research she originally did, 66.5% of all personal bankruptcy in the United States is due to medical costs. Two thirds of all personal bankruptcy in the United States comes from medical issues. So big issue, which we could tackle. Next, many of you, particularly out here in the Silicon Valley, where we believe hard work is great, um, have overlooked the fact that there is actually a ton of studies that suggest that work hours is positively associated with blood pressure, um, that the results from prospective observational studies, prospective means you observe over time, longitudinally, suggest that there's an approximately 40% excess risk of coronary heart disease in employees working long hours. The National Institute uh, NIOSH for Occupational Safety and Health reviews a bunch of studies that found, contrary to what your boss may be telling you, hard work and long hours are not good for you. Much beyond 40 hours, uh, the uh, uh, disease effects go up virtually monotonically um, and consistently. The evidence on the effect of work hours on health, including CVD, including metabolic syndrome, including heart attack and mortality, are striking. So striking that I am finding, looking for, uh, the lawyer who is going to do what, of course, lawyers will do. <laughs> I, I believe the workplace is, in fact, where cigarette was, cigarettes were 20 or 30 years ago, a lawsuit waiting to happen. Because the data are there, the evidence is there, and somebody is going to say, by the way, you can't continue uh, to do things to kill people. But maybe not, we'll see. Social support affects health. If you offer people policies and practices that signal that employees are well are taken care of and that you will come to their aid in times of physical and emotional and financial distress, if you provide people with social events, if you put them in teams, if you do things like DaVita does with the DaVita Village Network to collect money for people having difficulty, if you do what JetBlue and Southwest Airlines would do, which is to put people in groups and, and share and provide social support for people having hard times. If you do what the men's warehouse used to do when George Zimmer ran it, but those days are gone, uh, which is provide financial support for people having temporary financial setbacks. In other words, if you send signal to your employees that you actually care about them and that their colleagues will help them during difficult times, that buffers stress and it also reduces stress directly. So social support is something everybody can do. It's not that expensive. Uh, if you read Laszlo Bach's famous book, Work Rules, he talks about when he was still running HR at Google uh, to, say to, to, to say to all the Googlers, which is, I guess, what they call them, um, 
if you die while you are at Google, all of your stock will be vested immediately. And by the way, we will pay your salary, half of your salary, to your surviving spouse and family members for the next 10 years. Everybody says, my God, we can't afford it. He has data and work rules as to how small amount of money this costs. And it does not cost a lot to, to, to offer to the human beings who work for you and with you some sense of, you know, if something bad happens, we've got your back, as opposed to the typical message from companies, which I see all too often, which is when something bad happens to you, you're on your own. Work-family conflict affects health because it is a huge source of stress. And you can see three different studies which illustrate that um, employees who reported experiencing work-family conflict had higher levels of mood, anxiety, and substance dependence. They were more absent from work. They had more depression, poor health, and alcohol use. Perceived fairness and justice affects health. And the mechanism is pretty simple. When you are treated unfairly and capriciously and harshly by your workforce, by your workplace, or by your boss, you are going to perceive that as stressful. You're going to rebel against it and feel aggravated by it. And once again, there's a ton of data of which this is only a sample that finds, you know, for instance, for hospital employees in Finland, low justice and decision making was associated with a 41% higher risk of sickness and a 40% higher risk of self-reported poor health. So if nothing else, all these data plus a ton of data, which I am not going to bore you with this morning, should convince you two th of two things. Number one, there is, a, there is a large body of evidence that suggests the connection between work practices and health, and the effects are large. They're 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent. So it is, is a big difference depending upon how you Create your work environments. Layoffs and economic insecurity, of course, affect health. Controlling for prior health, somebody who's lost a job has a 54% higher chance of reporting uh, poor health. If respondents were healthy at baseline, losing a job from an establishment closure increased the odds of a new health condition by 83%. And by the way, even when, even respondents who found a new job had a 97% higher risk of developing a new health condition if they had suffered a job loss. So very much like losing health insurance, losing your job is not something, oh, I got, lost my job, now I've got it back, I'm okay. it's, it's all okay. No, it's actually not okay. Layoffs affect health. And mortality, the mechanism is pretty clear. The odds of, once you get laid off, the odds of committing suicide go up somewhere between two and two and a half times. And what, what is interesting is that the effect of layoffs on health are reasonably constant around the world. The magnitude of the effects are similar in Finland and in New Zealand and in the United States. So having a nice social safety net is fine, doesn't seem to change the mortality risks of this. Which is interesting. So the next time, you know, whenever I see, which I actually say to people, you know, people say, I need to do layoffs. I say, you understand that when you lay people off, you're going to kill some fraction of them. Oh, well, you know, I'd have to do it to make the quarter. <laughs> what are you willing to do to make the quarter? Job design and job control affects health. Employees with high job strain, something that we've known for a long time, which is high job demands coupled with low job control, had a more than twofold increase in cardiovascular mortality risk. What is high job control? What is an absence of job control? I'll give you an example. We have a friend. We're going out to dinner with them on a Saturday night. Get an email from the husband. We're going to have to cancel the event. My wife has been told on Thursday, by the way, five months pregnant, that on Saturday she will be on a United Airlines flight to Paris to arrive on Sunday so she can go to a meeting on Monday. Harvard MBA, skilled marketing professional, not told, by the way, you need to get this marketing job done. Get your butt on the plane Saturday night to arrive in Paris on Sunday to do the meeting on Monday. Not you, as a skilled human being, need to accomplish some marketing objectives, figure out how, when, and how, and why to do it. 
get on the plane. I am pleased to report, and it will not surprise a human being in this room, that that was the last plane she got on for that organization. People quit. Turnover is related to what you do to human beings. If you stress them, if you take away their job control, if you work them long hours, if you make them physically and mentally unhealthy, they will, sooner or later, oftentimes not soon enough, exit from your organization. Turnover is related to workforce health. Presenteeism. Presenteeism is related to workforce health, and obviously absenteeism is. Most of the data that I have seen recently suggests that 60% of, of workplace absence, as we get nervous about the latest coronavirus coming to the US, 60% of workplace absence is due to stress, not to flu or anything else. Study of the British Civil Service, fabulous articles, Studies done by a British epidemiologist called Sir Michael Marmot. Sir Michael Marmot said, it is interesting to me, the higher your level in the British civil service, the healthier you are, the lower your risk of cardiovascular disease. Why is that? Is it because higher level civil servants smoke less, drink less, exercise more, have better genetics? The answer is higher level British civil service, the higher you are in the civil service, the more control you have over your job. Job control is the single most important factor affecting your health and well-being. You can, can't change your genetics, but job control is something that, that, that makes people healthy. Most people, adult, human, normal people, would love to have a job that requires them to you know, use their brains and work, but they also want a job that permits them control over the conditions of their life and their work. The societal level costs of these workplace exposure, uh, exposures, which is estimated by figuring out how harmful are they, multiplied by how many people are exposed to them, comes up with this 120,000 excess deaths a year, and by the way, about $190 billion in excess costs. If you got rid of all the things I just talked about, which by the way, you can perfectly simply do, you would save people's lives, you save money, your organizations would perform better, it would be wonderful. And by the way, you would not give up anything as an employer. Layoffs do increase fear. They do decrease uh, morale. They do disrupt networks of relationships which are necessary to get products done and work done, but they, there is absolutely, believe it or not, people don't believe this, you can look it up, uh, scholar.google.com, the effects of layoffs on, and fill in your favorite term, there is no evidence that layoffs increase profits or increase stock price, or for that matter, even reduce costs in many instances. What about Work hours, there's a famous chart, some of you may have seen it, it's in The Economist magazine. On one axis is average work hours per country, on the other axis is productivity, and it's a nice linear relationship. The more hours a country on average works, the lower that country's level of productivity. That is true for industries as well. It is true over time. It's not just cross-sectional, as um, one OECD report said, an increase in working time was always accompanied by a decrease in per hour productivity. So the idea that you're working harder and doing better, probably not, you're working harder and making people sick, not doing better. All right, let me end with what to do. We're, we're like on time, we're ahead of time, it's great. Number one. Everybody in this room understands the quality movement. Everybody in this room has take management one, not by the way, even management 101, that's already more advanced. Everybody in the room understands that if you want to fix something, the first thing you need to do is measure it. If you want it as your, in your organization, if you said, I want to improve customer satisfaction, if I want to improve employee engagement, if I want to improve anything that you wanted to improve at some point, if I want to improve my net promoter score, the first thing you did was measure it. It's exactly correct. You can measure 
You're serious? Get serious? Workplace health? Yes, healthy workers are more productive, less likely to turn over, less likely to be absent, don't need a thousand studies to prove it. It's common sense. There are about a thousand studies that demonstrate this. I, I want to improve work for, workforce health. Measure it. Single item measure of self-reported health prospectively predicts morbidity and mortality. Single item measure. You guys are giving questionnaires out all the time. One item. How healthy are you? Prospectively predicts subsequent use of, um, of physicians and drugs and mortality. Measure it. Everybody in this room who's a large employer is got a health benefits administrator. Your health benefits administrator can provide you data on your employee base use of antidepressants, sleeping pills, ADHD drugs. This friend of mine went to work for a large organization. I won't name them today. I seem to be in a moment of discretion. She said, I started taking antidepressants the first week. I started talking to my colleagues in the organization, and I found virtually all of them were on antidepressants. Isn't this interesting? I said, yes, it's interesting. Actually, drug use is a measure of how stressed and how unhealthy the workplace is. How can I get measures of drug use? You've got a benefits administrator that knows everything. Measure the dimensions of work environments. Every dimension of a work environment that we have talked about. Work-family conflict, job control, um, work hours. These all have either straightforward, like work hours, how many hours do you work, or validated scales to measure this. You're serious about measuring your work environments. There are tons of validated scales, which I'll be happy to send you. Uh, they're not mine. They're, they've been validated in the literature over time. Measure it. Number one thing you can do. I'm serious about employee health and well-being. Let's measure it. And by the way, let's hold people accountable for it. So we got my friends Vitality, who also operate in the US, running the UK's Healthiest Workplace Survey. I'm trying to get them to publish the list of the world's, of the UK's unhealthiest companies. That will get more change. Prioritize human health and well-being. Every day when a human being comes to work for you, they have entrusted to you their health and their well-being, both physical and mental. Do you as an organization accept responsibility for that? Or do you say, don't like it, leave, can't hack it, leave, not my problem? Prioritize it. Next. Provide people more job autonomy. This is relatively simple. For 50 years, we've said job autonomy leads to higher levels of engagement and motivation. By the way, it also leads to better physical and mental health because most people love to be treated as adults rather than children. Get rid of, get rid of the layers of management who job is to watch people watch people watch other people do the work. As my friend Dean Baker at Patagonia said, we believe in Patagonia by management, by absence. How do you ensure sufficient levels of delegation? We give people large enough spans of control that they cannot micromanage. You can design it in. Next, offer more job security and certainty. Let people know their schedules well in advance, and yes, you can avoid layoffs. Southwest Airlines has never had a layoff or a furlough in the cyclical industry of airlines. SAS Institute, the largest privately owned software company in the world, did not lay anybody off in the 2000 recession, did not lay off anybody in the 2008 recession. And perhaps the most inspiring story is Barry Waymiller, run by Bob Chapman, who's written this book that some of you may have heard of, called Everybody Matters. Manufacturing company, about $3 billion. Manufacturing, they lost 30% of their business in the downturn in 2008. What are we going to do? First response, we should probably lay people off. No, when we lay people off, we have, in fact, adversely affected their financial well-being, their mental and their physical health. That's not a nice thing to do, says Bob. So we're going to figure out how to get through this recession without laying off a single human being. And he did it. You can read how he did it. The details are things like, instead of laying off 
30% of the people 100%, you lay off a fraction of the people. Instead of laying off all, a fraction of the people all the way, you lay off everybody a part of the way. So everybody takes what Hewlett Packard used to call the nine day fortnight. Work for 10 days, get paid for nine. Everybody, you do work sharing. You do job sharing. You do, you ask people, can you, uh, can you take your vacation now? And people figured out who could do better uh, um, face that and take the things and elderly and work, they traded across generations and they did all kinds of things. He did no layoffs. It is completely possible to not lay people off. Create work environments that provide social support. This costs almost nothing. Have social events, put people in teams, give people the version of, not necessarily as generous as Google's thing, but give people an opportunity um, and a sense of social support and financial support when they're having hard times. Uh, DaVita has the DaVita Village Network. This is people contribute money and the company matches it. And so when people are having financial trouble, like from illness or an accident or something, the organization comes to their aid. The money matters. What matters more is the message. We care about you. We are here to take care of you. Not watch your back. We've got your back. It's a very different message. It's one of the reasons why DaVita has a, in a very high turnover uh, kind of job setting a, um, a relatively low level of turnover. Most people would rather work for a place that takes care of them. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't take a ton of research to demonstrate that, but it's true. Limit off time work and provide adequate time off. Um, when Dean Baker, who runs HR for Patagonia, who used to work for Sears, he got an email one Christmas Eve, says, by the way, you know, I need something he replied to the email the next morning, got a message back, said, what took you so long? I said, what happens to Patagonia if somebody does it? He said, well, we try to send that person to a competitor. <laughs> well, they could do damage to their organization, not mine. You get fired. This is unacceptable behavior. Give people time off. Give people sick days. You know, let, in other words, once again, take people, you know, give them adequate time off and show that you support them. And most importantly and most simply, though nobody seems to have ever thought of this, is do employee-centered job redesign using design thinking principles. I suspect almost everybody in this room has used design thinking as you've built your software, to, as you've bought, built your software systems, as you've built your products, as you've built your experiences. Do, do design thinking about the job. Same way, anthropologically follow people around. Ask, put people in teams. How can I make your job better and easier? What parts of your job could we get rid of and no one would know? How do we make your job simpler and easier? How do we support you in your job? SAS Institute, this private software company, has a 35-hour work week. Jim Goodnight, co-founder, CEO, how can you possibly work people only 35 hours? Because most people don't work 35 hours. Every hour people are spending in the check-in meetings. We don't have check-in meetings. We actually trust our employees. How weird. Every hour people are spending fighting with their benefits people, worrying about how do I take care of my elder, how do I take, take, deal with child care, how do I deal with elder care. I have a staff that provides, we provide on-site child care, we help people with elder care and adoption assistance so that everybody doesn't have to be, spend hours becoming an expert in adoption and child care and elder care. And by the way, we have a chief health officer whose job is not to cut costs, but whose job is to help people access great health care with a minimum amount of paperwork. We're going to simplify the job. We are going to take parts of the job that add no value to anybody and get rid of them. We are going to do employee-centered job design. And if you did employee-centered job design, I suspect you'd find that you could redesign your jobs in ways that would eliminate, as you eliminate a lot of the activity, 
and a lot of the unnecessary stuff and you buffered them with other people to do it and you use software appropriately to help them do their work, then you could probably reduce stress enormously. But in order to do that, you have to be willing to lean into that process and to say, I care as much about employees as I do my customers. At the end, what you want to do is you want to build a culture of wellness, which is based upon organizational values and actions that promote personal and professional growth, efficiency of practice, which is what we just talked about, workplace systems and processes that promote safety, quality, effectiveness, and positive interactions. And of course, you want to do what most people are spending most of their time on, which is only a third of the problem, which is personal resilience. Yes, it's great to give people um, uh, stress reduction workshops and resilience training and you know how to live, uh, you know how to how to put up with all this. This is all great. I, th I think personal resilience is is fabulous. But as I said to somebody who asked me once about nap pods, I, you know, he said, "What do you think about this organization? They have nap pods." I said, "If people who had enough sleep, you wouldn't need a nap pod." Somebody said to me, what do you think about stress reduction workshops? I said, what about a stress prevention workshop? So that you did not have to reduce it. You would prevent it in the first place. We know in virtually every domain of health and well-being that prevention is more effective than remediation. And that's really what we're talking about in terms of job design to design stress out of the job and a set of management practices that prevent people from experiencing the, the stress and ill health, which is kind of causing all kinds of difficulty. So by the clock on my watch, uh, we have three minutes for questions. And my friends tell me I actually have longer than because we started late so I can end early or whatever we can do. Anyway, if anyone has any questions about anything, we have covered an enormous amount of material. But the basic ideas are simple. You're all in the healthcare business. What you do in the workplace profoundly affects people's physical and psychological well-being. There are a set of practices that make people sick. We know what they are. There are a set of practices that make people healthy. We know what they are. The costs are enormous. And I'm ready for questions. And I got a question already from the front. Yes, ma'am. Activity, revenue, you know, all those kinds of things related to the organization health. Have you heard of any organization that has organ employee health indicators that they're using to present to, you know, management, to shareholders, and to employees? That's an interesting question. Uh, have I heard of any? Uh, the answer is yes, I've heard of any. I haven't heard of many. Um, and one is an organization that is redesigning the primary care experience. And uh, in case you don't know, physician burnout is a huge problem. Uh, 500 doctors killed themselves last year. That's more than one a day. Um, and so if you are going to redesign the primary care experience, and it's going to be both patient-centered, it's also going to be provider-centered, you need to do something about physician burnout. So this organization is actually quite concerned about burnout and workplace stress, and they are radically, and I mean really radically, willing to redesign what, phys what, what doctors do. The doctors do not, nobody went into medicine to be its secretary, and doctors really resent desktop medicine. And so but the, this is an organization that has hired 100 software people, which is a big number for that particular organization. And everything is on the table. They're meeting collaboratively. What parts of your job can we get rid of? What parts of our job can we have done by somebody else? What can we do to make your life you know, better so that at the end of the day, you don't go home and want to shoot yourself or uh, you know, take DoorDash or something, but you, uh, but, uh, but, but you feel that, that you've lived a fulfilled life. So there are a relatively small number of organizations that are beginning to measure employee well-being because, and I'm hoping there will be more. I mean, this is why I wrote Dying for a Paycheck. That's why I'm, you know, standing up here and, you know, berating you and all this other stuff. I'm hoping that more and more organizations will recognize the connections between employee health and company profitability. 
it is not me standing up here, though it's kind of me standing up here. I mean, there's a ton of data that suggests that the indirect costs, presenteeism, absenteeism, and turnover, are multiple times the direct cost of healthcare. So when you have an unhealthy employee that's costing you n thousands of dollars, the indirect costs of that are five to ten times that. So I'll show you a survey that says presentee absenteeism is costing the United States $150 billion a year, and presenteeism is costing us $1.5 trillion. So companies are paying. This is, this is not like, you know, I got people turning over, I got people sick, I got people absent, and it's not costing me anything. So, it's, it's, so if we actually measure this, you have more profitable companies as well. So yes. what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to ask the final two questions. And uh oh, I'm in trouble as a show now. of hands, who here in your organization is actually looking at employee well being? Okay. And just a bit a history lesson for everybody. If you go back to the mid to late 90s, referencing Sears, the Sears service profit chain, look at employee satisfaction's linkage to customer satisfaction, in turn, financial outcomes. You know, that was. 20 plus years ago, and now we've had engagement, and now well being is getting a lot of press. But my question to you is this you wrote, also wrote the knowing doing gap. Yes. So you make a lot of sense up here, and like, I think we all know and agree, but organizations aren't doing it. Why do you think that is? What we can do about it? I think the number one reason why organizations are not doing anything. It's a great question. At the moment, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, I and a fabulous colleague who's joined the medical school named Sarah Singer have done a bunch of interviews with leading edge companies. We started with the leading edge, leading edge. And the leading edge companies, of course, all recognize the connection between employee health and company performance and the various financial metrics. They all have figured this out. And none of them, of course, are doing what they need to do, with one or two exceptions. And so we are trying to figure out and answer exactly that question. And I can give you a long set of answers. I'll try to give you a short set of answers. Number one, most organizations see job design as fixed. So I had a guy in a finance organization, one of these fancy finance places. He said, you know, he said, I'm quitting. HR guy, he says, I'm quitting. He says, I can't put up with the pace anymore. We got the 100-hour work week. You know, we're having trouble recruiting the new generation of people because they don't want to work 100 hours. They'd like to see their family in something other than a screensaver. Um, you know, we got turnover. The turnover is expensive. I can give you the cost of turnover. But this is what finance is. It's bullshit. It's not what finance is. God did not come down and say financial, finance jobs have to be shit. <laughs> there is no reason why these jobs cannot be re-engineered and redesigned. They haven't tried. So number one problem, it is what it is, and I am unable to do anything about it. The sense of absence of agency, and we're talking now to heads of HR of some companies that have half a million employees and make a zillion dollars and have fancy technology and have fancy, to use the phrase that we've already heard several times this morning, people analytics, and they've got all the stuff, and, but they feel, it, they feel inef and inefficacious, they feel Unagentic. They feel that they can't do anything, that it is what it is, and they cannot intervene, which is, I think, bizarre. But anyway, that's so I think that's number one. Number two, I've had senior executives say to me, I am not responsible for my employees' physical, mental well being. If, you know, I, I, we have a condition, this is America, or, you know, free market. You know, I offer them, you know, you go to work for the, my organization, you, you, you know what it is. I mean, you know, at, at this point, if someone takes a job at Amazon and they don't know what they're getting into, they haven't read the damn New York Times or anything else. So they have signed up voluntarily, dollar for condition, and they know what it is. I'm not responsible for this. They're, you know, it's, if, if, you know if, if they want to work in a different place, let them go find a job at Patagonia or right. Mary Waymiller or whatever. Right. So, so the free market idea, I think that's, that's number two. And number three, people, 
we get this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. No one wants to take on a problem that they believe is unsolvable, but if no one takes on the problem, the problem is never solved. <laughs> and so I get people who say, I cannot change my work environments in ways that will make it healthier and more productive and all this other stuff. And I say, how do you know that? And they say, well, you know, I don't, but I haven't tried. Because I believe it won't work, or because I believe it's impossible, no one wants to take on something where they're going to fail. And so the best way to not fail is to not try. And so, and so a lot of organizations see the problem in great detail. I mean, we've done these interviews, you see like, you know, oh yes, we've got turnover of this, and we've got absenteeism of this, and the level of depression is this, and yes, we are like mainlining, you know, uh, the, the, the antidepressants, and you know, all of this stuff. So, so, so they see the problem, they do not, they do, they, they, and because they never try to solve it, they never do solve it, and therefore they believe it's become unsolvable. So it's really a mindset thing. And, and, the difference, and the difference between my friend Amir Dan Rubin and One Medical, who's solving, redesigning primary care, and the difference between uh, Bob Chapman, who wrote Everybody Matters, and Barry Waymiller, and the difference between Dean Gordon and Patagonia, and the difference between a bunch of these other people is they say it is, it is unacceptable. We cannot afford to continue to do what we're doing. We cannot afford the current toll. We cannot afford to have 60% of our absences caused by, st by workplace stress. We cannot afford you know, to have a turnover rate which is this high. We cannot afford soaring healthcare costs. We cannot afford the, 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 the toll of chronic disease, and so therefore we're gonna do something. Well, Dr. Pepper, on behalf of everybody here, thank you for sharing your ideas. Well done.